Good evening, everyone. Good evening. And thank you very much for coming out on a very cold, blustery day uh, out in the town. And thank you very much for attending the meeting tonight. This is the biggest space with seating in the town. So we wanted to use the biggest space to try and get as many people in as possible. And obviously to, my name is, sorry, before I ask, so I've got a list of things to do and you're looking at how not to run a meeting. So please feel free to point the 10 things out that go wrong. Um, my name's Andrew Lay, I'm the mayor of the town, very proud to be the mayor of the town. And welcome to the meeting on the future of St. Peter's and healthcare within our town and impact in our district too. I'm gonna to run through a couple of bits of housekeeping first. If I can ask you to put your phones to silent, if you've got phones here, um, that would be very helpful. In, I've asked to be, point out as well, a bit of the air steward thing. The emergency exits, should the fire alarm go off, are here and here, and there's an exit here. So if you hear the alarm, please feel free, uh, make your way quietly and calmly to the exits. Uh, hopefully that won't happen tonight. Um, and I'll run through the format as to how the meeting is going to be structured today so that everyone's aware at the start what's going to happen and what we're looking and having the participation of people throughout the meeting. Um, certainly it's a, a town meeting is a very old tradition and being a very old town, when there was trouble or where there was things to celebrate, the town would have their meeting in the central hall. And this is, following this format, this is what we're looking to do, do today. So, present on stage at the moment, we have, I'll introduce the people that are here, we have the Right Honourable Sir John Whittingdale MP for Malden. We have Tracy Dowling, the CEO of Mid, Mid and South Essex Integrated Care Board for the NHS. We have Matt Sweeting, the Medical Director for the Mid and South Essex Integrated Care Board. And Deborah Goldsmith, Director of Midwifery again for NHS Mid and South Essex Integrated Care Board. And additionally, we have the leader of Morden District Council, ca uh, Councillor Richard Siddle as well. So a panel that can answer and certainly would give some information from the re recent uh, announcement that was made regarding St. Peter's. Following their presentation and speaking to you, um, we will then have questions and uh, questions what, uh, will be asked from the audience here. Um, we have two lecterns at the front. You may have noticed them in a sort of town hall style uh, way of, of dealing with it. Um, and certainly after the last presentation from Councillor Richard Siddle, we'll leave an opportunity for people if they need a comfort break at that time to go uh, uh, outside if they need to. But obviously to start the Q&A session, with queues either side, if you could queue either side to ask your questions or to set some context and a question for the people on the board here, um, who will be happy to answer your questions. It started, at, we've started at seven o'clock. We're looking, we have the hall at roughly till nine o'clock. So we'll try to fit as many questions from people in as possible um, during that time. So obviously we want to, be, to make sure that people um, get to ask their questions, and certainly that um, the people respect the people that are here and ask their questions. We don't particularly, I don't want to particularly deal with abuse or, or anything like that. There's a lot of good people here to ask some good questions, but obviously I just want to mention that we, we may have to stop the meeting. I'd hope not. I'm sure there'll be great questions from the, from the audience, but just to make that clear that everything is okay, we will continue with the meeting. Um, also, I'm going to ask that members of the public get to ask their questions first, and uh, my fellow elected officials wait to a point slightly later. So it's an opportunity for people of the town, who are not usually in that position, to ask their questions. And, and I think that's very important that the NHS, Sir John, and uh, Richard, uh, Councillor Richard Siddle get an opportunity to hear the views and the questions of the residents of the town and the surrounding area. So um, we would look to do that. It may be your first time here. There is no such thing as a silly question. If you've heard me at a council meeting, there really isn't a silly thing as a question. So please feel free to ask any question that you feel you wish to do. Um, as I said, after the presentations have, have happened. Um, 
So thank you very much and welcome. You don't want any more waffle from me. We'll start the talk on, uh, from the individuals on the panel. We'll first start with Sir John Whittingdale, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Andrew. Um, it's very good that so many people are here this evening, although I'm not surprised. Um, I felt it was very important uh, that as well as the consultation uh, exercise that the NHS has arranged with drop-in centres, with exhibitions, there was one in Morrison's this afternoon, but that we also had an opportunity for everybody uh, who feels strongly about St Peter and, and its future to come together, both to hear directly from the NHS about the options on the table, but also to express their views. Um, I am very much aware of the strength of feeling in Malden and the district about St Peter's. Um, I myself have been treated there. I was there a couple of months ago visiting a friend in the stroke rehab unit. Uh, I am in no doubt of the affection that many people have for St Peter's. But equally, if you have been there, you know that it wasn't originally designed to be a hospital. It's 150 years old. And whilst the quality of care at St. Peter's is second to none, uh, and the dedication of the staff there is fantastic, the building is old and is becoming steadily harder to maintain. Now, we have been in discussion about what should happen for almost as long as I've been your Member of Parliament here. And if there is one thing that does cause me anger is that we still don't have a replacement or an alternative in place. But this actually has brought that matter to a head. It's not to say we're not making progress. Uh, many of you may know there is going to be a brand new health centre in Haybridge, for instance, as part of the development there. It's going to be the same sort of size as the one that uh, recently was built at South Woodham, the Crouch Vale Medical Centre. But that is not going to be a replacement for St Peter's. And we will hear shortly uh, from the NHS about both the reasons why uh, this consultation is now taking place and the potential options for the future. But the one thing that I am absolutely clear about, and I hope that Tracy, as the chief executive, will be able to give further detail of this, but the outpatient services which are used by thousands of people across the district in St Peter's must continue to be available to the people in Malden and in the district. And it isn't just the town. I suspect there may be quite a few people here this evening from the Denji Peninsula. And we know very well that the journey from the Denji to Malden is not a short one. The journey from the Denji to anywhere outside Malden, like Broomfield or Braintree, is just far too far. And so we must have a continuation of those services in Malden. There are also questions, obviously, about the other facilities there, the maternity unit, uh, the stroke rehab beds, uh, and that is all part of the consultation of the options. And the one th other thing I would just like to say is, is I believe the consultation is a real one. I know one or two people think that it's all a stitch up, but everything's already been decided. Uh, I hope you will hear very clearly that that is not the case. I intend to make sure it's not the case. Um, this is just the beginning the consultation exercise will run for several more weeks. I intend to continue to raise these matters uh, and make sure that the views which you will express tonight are fully uh, taken into account before any decisions are taken. But this is not for me to uh, speak to you. What I want is for you to be able to hear directly from the people uh, who are going to be responsible for those decisions. Uh, so Tracy, Matt and Deborah representing the NHS I'm grateful to uh, them for being here and also to Richard Siddle uh, for the District Council because I think the District Council may also have a role to play. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Tracy Dowling, who is the CEO of the um, Interim Care Board. So I'll ask Tracy to step up now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you, Sir John. Um, and particularly, thank you, Sir John, for arranging this meeting tonight and giving you the opportunity to hear the proposals that we're putting to you. But also, the main reason why I'm pleased to be here tonight is so that we can hear what matters to you, so that we can hear your views and your perspectives on these proposals. There are things that we know about these services, 
but there are things that you know about your needs, the needs of your families, uh, and we need to understand those needs. And, and we are consulting very genuinely to listen and to learn and to hear from you and people across other parts of Mid and South Essex who are impacted by these proposals. What are the things that matter to you that we need to also take into account when we're considering making decisions about the future of these services. So I do just want to emphasize, this is a genuine consultation. That is why there are options. We don't have a preferred choice, for example, around the stroke services and, and the options around the intermediate care beds, because it's really important to us that we understand what the different implications of those choices are on people across Mid and South Essex, but particularly people in Malden, given um, the, the breadth of services that have been provided and continue to be provided from St Peter's. I would like to assure you again that no decisions have yet been taken on these proposals. As you know, and as is set out in the documents, the stroke rehabilitation beds and the midwifery-led birthing unit have been temporarily relocated to safeguard the safety of the patients and of the staff due to the safety risks inherent now in the building of St Peter's Hospital. But what we are consulting on are the two proposals around what we would like to be the permanent relocations of those two areas of service and that's what we want to hear people's views on. Also, the outpatient x-ray and blood test services remain currently at St Peter's. And before I go through the proposals, I do want to reassure you that there is no intention to stop providing those outpatient or diagnostic services at St Peter's Hospital until we have another location in Malden that, that can provide those services in really well-designed, modern facilities uh, to deliver those services. And, and, and you'll see from the proposals, there is a significant volume of services. There are approximately 200 blood tests done a day. It, it doesn't take very long to get a blood test. People need that facility locally. We understand that, but we do want to hear from you what matters to you. I'm going to use the summary document, uh, the 12-page consultation document, which, which has, I hope, been made available for all of you tonight. There are copies on, on people's chairs. As the brief to take you through the proposal, and then I'll ask Dr. Sweeting, who's our Chief Medical Officer, um, uh, both within the Integrated Care Board and also a consultant at Broomfield Hospital, to share his understanding, his thoughts and opinions around um, these proposals. And I'll also ask Deborah uh, Goldsmith, who is the Director of Midwifery Services, to talk about, from her professional perspective, why she believes that these changes are important for uh, birthing uh, women and birthing people uh, in um, Mid and South Essex, and particularly here in Malden. We are recording the discussions tonight so that we can capture your views and capture your opinions. And, and we will be using that recording to make sure that we take all of your views and, uh, and opinions and the things that matter to you into account as part of the decision-making process around these proposals following the end of the formal consultation. I would also like to ask that you phone us, that you write to us, that you email us, that you complete the survey if, if you want to complete the survey and if that method works for you. Um, and there are other meetings as well that are advertised on our website and, and our communications people, if you want to learn about the details and dates of those, can take you through that. I think, I'm looking for Claire, I think it's the 19th of March that we've got a, 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 a drop-in session and some presentations in Malden in the town hall. We've got other events in supermarkets. There was one today. So we very genuinely do want to hear what you need to tell us and what we need to take account of as we go through the process of making decisions about the future of the services. So um, I would just like to take you through the proposals and, 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 and use this document which, which you can take away and think about further uh, if you want to make further responses to us. So this document on page two 
tells you what our proposals are. So in summary, the proposals are to change how and where people across the whole of Mid and South Essex receive inpatient intermediate care services and stroke rehabilitation inpatient services, which are the bed-based services that are provided from community hospitals. We're proposing to make permanent the relocation of the freestanding midwife-led birthing unit from St. Peter's Hospital to the William Julian Courtall Birthing Unit at Braintree Community Hospital. And that's where that midwife-led birthing unit has been temporarily relocated to. And we're also asking for your views on the possibility of moving all of the other patient services. So the outpatient services, some of them being outpatients that are delivered by Mid and South Essex Foundation Trust, like ophthalmology, orthopaedics, rheumatology. Others being community-based outpatient services delivered by Provide, such as physiotherapy, audiology, and, and a number of different outpatient uh, services provided for children and for adults. We'd like your views on the possibility of moving those services provided at St. Peter's currently to other locations in and around Malden. And, and, and we genuinely do not have any firm proposals for what those relocation places might be. We want and need to hear your views about your town so that we can explore those and, and, and develop further what those, what those options might be. So if I take you further through the document, on page three, there is more of a description to describe the different types of services that the proposals relate to. On page four, there's a little bit more information that explains how many people that um, go into hospital are likely to need intermediate care, bed-based services, as part of that journey back home for their rehabilitation. And also how many people that, that, that have the misfortune to suffer a stroke across Mid and South Essex might need specialist rehabilitation in a specialist community centre staffed by specialist neuro and stroke rehabilitation teams to really maximise their chances of regaining as much independence and function following that stroke as possible. So you can see there that about 75% of people who suffer a stroke go straight home, 25% need additional intensive and specialist rehabilitation and support if they are to be able to regain as much function and independence as possible. In terms of the stroke and intermediate care beds, pages six and seven set out the two options that we'd like to understand people's views on. So the first option is that we develop a single 50-bed stroke rehabilitation unit based at Brentwood Community Hospital. That we also have 22 intermediate care beds at the Cumberledge Intermediate Care Centre in Rochford. And that we permanently close the stroke rehabilitation ward at St Peter's Hospital. And, and the document sets out some of the... Um, impacts as we see them but we want to hear from people's views more about what those impacts might be. The alternative option is that we have a 25 bed specialist stroke rehabilitation unit at Brentwood Community Hospital and that we also have 25 intermediate care beds at Brentwood Community Hospital. In order to have enough stroke rehabilitation beds to meet the stroke rehabilitation need across Mid and South Essex, we would also have 22 stroke rehabilitation specialist beds at the Cumberledge Intermediate Care Centre in Rochford. That also would mean permanently closing the stroke rehabilitation ward at St Peter's Hospital in Malden. So we want, we want to hear your views on that. In terms of the option on page eight about the midwife, the freestanding midwife-led birthing unit, the proposal there is that the move that has been made temporarily to relocate that unit to the WJC building at Braintree is made permanent. And again, in the document there, it sets out some of the predicted impacts for people using that service that that we envisage, but again, we would like to hear more views on that. 
And then in terms of the outpatient services, um, as I've already said, uh, given the closure and movement of the bed-based services, the services that remain at St. Peter's Hospital continue to be housed in uh, rundown facilities that are dilapidated and, and, and much loved, but, but you know, that is not a modern facility for delivering modern healthcare to modern standards, despite superb staff wanting to deliver excellent care. We want them to be able to deliver excellent care in really excellent facilities. So we don't yet have a range of proposals for what those alternative places might be, but we want to engage and hear what those proposals might be and what would be the features of those proposals that would really matter to people so that we can build that into our evaluation of the different options that are developed and that we'd need to consider. And, and the document there gives some idea of the volume of activity that is undertaken per day and, and you know, that's a sizable volume, 80, more than 80,000 appointments a year. Significant proportion, about 40,000 are for blood tests. Um, so just to give you some idea, that's about 200 a day. There is obviously a lot of concern about what therefore that means for the future of St. Peter's Hospital as a, as a site and as a building that has served the people of Malden well for over 150 years. But the fact is that the age, condition and suitability of St. Peter's Hospital now means that we do need to explore providing alternative accommodation for these services to be provided to, to, to modern standards in, in facilities that are fit for the delivery of those services. If we do decide that none of the health services that we are responsible for commissioning will be provided from St Peter's Hospital, then I think it's only honest, and we've got this in this document, to share that we feel that it is likely that the owners of that site, Mid and South Essex Foundation Trust and Essex Partnership Foundation Trust, as the site owners, would probably decide to close St Peter's Hospital permanently. But I do want to reassure you that we will not be moving the outpatient and the diagnostic services until we have an alternative facility for the provision of those services within the town. The final page of the document says how you can get involved. And uh, we've got further meetings um, as well as the meeting that we've got this evening. As I've already said, there is a document, uh, there is a meeting on the 19th of March in the town hall for people to come to and, and that's open for people to drop in and to talk to, to, to my colleagues about these changes. We're running the consultation for eight weeks until the 21st of March. And, and we're running it for that period of time with a number of forums and a number of different methods for us to collect people's views. And when we get those views, we will have them independently collated for us so that, that we are not doing that collation. We've asked an independent organization to pull all of those views together for us so that we can then consider them as part of the decision-making process that we would then need to undertake. But those views will be taken and into full account as we reach those decisions. I would like to hand over to Dr. Matthew Sweeting to talk about some of the clinical considerations that he and his colleagues have um, given thought to in terms of the development of these proposals and why they as a clinical body believe that these proposals will improve services for patients. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, for bringing us together, uh, and thank you, uh, Sir John, as well, uh, for also bringing us together and hosting us. Uh, as Mrs. Tracy Dowling said, I'm uh, Dr. Matthew Sweeting. Um, I'm the medical director here at our, our system NHS, but I'm also a local clinician and a consultant geriatrician, so a cons consultant older person doctor at Broomfield Hospital. Um, I know these services well. Um, and in fact, our department has provided clinicians to support our intermediate care beds and our stroke beds for many years. I also have patients that I still manage that are managed here um, in the Malden area. So I do know the geography and some of the health services. 
my job really is not to go over what uh, Mrs. Tracy Dallin has said already, but to actually give a rationale for some of the medical reasons or the clinical reasons why we think this consultation is important. Uh, as Mrs. Dowling has said, um, we are very keen to hear from you, particularly the people of Morden, um, about our options and proposals, uh, and this will be independently collected, uh, and then we will consider all the options. As you can see, the options are out on the table. I'm going to focus on a couple of things. I'm going to focus on the rationale for our, our rehabilitation beds, and also some of our outpatient services that were mentioned previously. Uh, and my colleague, uh, Mrs. Deborah Goldsmith, our uh, Director of Midwifery, will focus on uh, the babies and children's side of things. Clearly, we would both cover both. If we go to rehabilitation, then there's a nice, if I, I refer to page four here, there's a nice uh, introduction to what, what, what we mean by that. Um, so as I said, I'm an older person doctor, and often uh, when you are an older person and have undergone major surgery, or if you've had a significant illness and you've taken to bed for a while, you need a period of rehabilitation. Most of my patients do not want to go to a bed. They want to go home, and I think that's very clear. And my job as the chief clinician is to hear that. And we know that people that go home early usually have better outcomes. So our whole drive in medicine is to get people fit, to improve their rehabilitation, and to make sure they can get home as independently as they can to their own homes. As you can see, if you're, if, if you're older and sometimes if you're frailer, you need some time and occasionally a small percentage of our population will need a, bed, a bedded unit like we've discussed here where people can come and have prolonged rehabilitation to improve function so that they can go home independently or for, with some extra support. We know in our area um, that we think around 2,000 people a year mainly older people within our region, that's the whole of Mid-South Essex, will need some form of rehabilitation uh, in, a, in a unit uh, rather than going directly home. We know for our stroke population, this is far more focused, but we think around 500 people a year will need some form of intervention in a bedded unit before they can go home uh, to live independent lives, God willing. That's the background to this. I have, we have convened a group of clinicians to look over the evidence base and the available st estates, and these are the outputs that we have put here in this consultation, which I won't outline because they've already been done. But the key is to give a good spread of beds around our system so that people can get rehabilitation uh, when they need it, particularly older people as well. That is key number one for us, uh, and having a focus for people getting home. Number two would be the focus on our stroke population. This is a very specialist type of rehabilitation that revolves specialists, particularly uh, multiple therapists as well, who often train particularly in stroke rehabilitation, not generalist rehabilitation. We feel, and looking at some of our evidence base and other areas, that bringing centres of excellence to our Mid and South Essex population will give our population, those that have had a stroke, the best chance of recovery, survival, and leaving independent lives. And therefore, the proposals here we feel uh, are, are the, the best proposals within our confines of our estates, where we can attract staff, provide high quality services within a modern estate uh, that can also improve outcomes. The other thing I wanted to touch on was the outpatient services. Now, Mrs. Tracy Dallin has been clear about those the 80,000 or so, 40,000 of those being blood tests. That is really important for the people of Morden that you can access these local services when you need to. And as you said, we are committed to providing those locally, uh, as you have heard. We are open to hear your thoughts and considerations for that. We are committed also as a group of clinicians to work closely with our hospital trust to ensure that we find facilities that are adequate, but also support each other so that people can get their blood tests, have their x-rays and see a specialist, whether that's a consultant or, or another specialist as well. So in summary, there has been a, a, a tremendous amount of clinician engagement, doctors, nurses, therapists, both at our local level, in our system, so in our one million population across Mid and South Essex, and at our regional level with my, some of my regional colleagues as well. 
we do feel we have looked at our evidence base uh, and also feel we, we are excited about these proposals to improve outcomes for our population and to get um, those people that need rehabilitation at home as quickly uh, as we can. I'm now going to hand over uh, to Mrs. Uh, Deborah Goldsmith, who will explain uh, a bit more about our midwifery services. Um, thank you, Matt, and uh, thank you, Mayor, for having us tonight and inviting me, and thank you to the councillors. And also, thank you, I can see a lot of my staff in the audience, so, audience, so it's really nice that you've come so we can discuss and listen to um, what you think about our, dis um, our proposals. But before we go to the proposals, I think it's really helpful that you understand the journey that we've been on. I've been, um, I've been with this trust for two years, and... We have three maternity units within the footprint of MSE for this area. So we have Broomfield, which is our high-risk maternity that also has a low-risk um, birthing unit alongside it. And then we also have two standalone birth centres, so St Peter's, currently in St Peter's, currently in WJC. We have lots of activity in the birth centres. Um, at the moment, WJC, WJC has been open since October. Prior to that, it was closed for almost two and a half years to interpartum care. St Peter's uh, Birth Centre has also traditionally um, antenatal, intrapartum, postnatal care. We made a very difficult decision um, at, in, towards the end of the summer last year to um, intermittently provide labour care at WJC. The rationale for that is that we had two birth centres that were constantly closed for intrapartum care. So for example, St Peter's was doing maybe seven births a month and WJC wasn't doing any. So as a system, we reviewed this and we then temporarily moved the labour care to WJC. We did this on the basis of the footprint, as you all know, St Peter's, the old, the old estate, and that really, we all know, it's not currently fit for purpose. But if we, had, if we could just open one of our birth centres where we could ring fence it so that it was open all the time so that the women did have a choice to birth in a standalone birth centre because last year and the two years before that, women and the but women birthing people were not having that choice so I might be a midwife by background but I'm also a mum so I know that women need to have this choice we made this decision as well in terms of our patients expecting to come to St Peter's come in there the doors closed sorry you've got to go to Brimfield so our proposal is that we have one birthing unit that will be ring-fenced and stayed open 24-7 for patient experience, run by dedicated, passionate midwives that will provide that service, and that our, our service users will know that that, that birth centre is going to be open for all kinds of care for them. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Um, I now call upon Councillor Richard Siddle, leader of Morden District Council. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Councillor Lay, uh, the Mayor, and Visitor John for organising this evening. I've come along to put the view from the District Council in terms of how we want to work with the NHS to ensure that we retain, if at all possible, the NHS services within the Malden town. Malden District Council are disappointed that the NHS has allowed the situation to get to such an extent that it may be necessary Thank you. It may be necessary to move services away, and perhaps this could have been avoided. 
<clears throat> Given the position we are now facing, the Council accepts that the most important thing is to prevent further reduction of NHS services within the Malden District. Malden District Council is committed to working closely with the NHS to ensure those services remain in the district and we will do all we can to support the NHS should services need to be relocated. This includes using the council's buildings. Now, one of the things we were criticised for a few years ago was the fact that our officers weren't in the council. We've now adopted that flexible working with our staff and still maintain the services at Malden District Council. By adopting that flexibility in hybrid working, it means that we have the opportunity to enable use of our buildings. Currently, we are identifying which buildings in the town and the district could provide a home for the long list of outpatient services. However, at this stage, there are only potential options, and of course they are subject to commercial sensitivities. The council has assets that already act as a community hub. Therefore, we must look to our estate and all the discussions with the NHS are commercially sensitive. However, we would make sure that we go through robust governance and scrutiny to look at how we work with the NHS to use what we already have in the town centre as a community hub, with lots of space in it now because of the hybrid working. Already the police are there. Already we use the citizens' advice there. Barclays Bank is there. We really want to work with the NHS to ensure that we look at that asset, look at our estates, and see how we can work with the NHS to ensure that you still have services within Malden District and within the town. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Siddle. Um, obviously, we've been on stage and talking for about 40, 45 minutes. So well, we'll now move to the question and answer session. And anyone who needs a break or to use the facilities, please feel free to do so. There are two um, lecterns at the front, and I'd ask any residents to come forward who would like to ask a question, or would like to speak or share their views with the panel here. Thank you. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. I read somewhere £18 million needs to be spent on the hospital. I'm just wondering who decided that figure? Because I've been up there recently, outpatients, blood tests, radiology, and all the departments I went in seemed perfectly normal. And I also read that the upper levels aren't safe. Well, my house before this was 200 years old. I didn't pull it down and go somewhere else. I repaired it. So my question to you is... £18 million is a lot of money to, be, to do repairs. If the ground level is OK, because from my readings, it was the upper levels. Apparently, old people are heavy and the floor wouldn't take it. <laughs> That didn't make sense to me, but I understood, OK. Well, then, use the £18 million, take the top two levels off, repair the bottom level, and I'm sure that wouldn't come to £18 million. As you said, 8,000 visits, eight, sorry, 80,000 80, visits a day. Malden is growing daily. How many housing estates have we got gone up in the last two years? Moving the maternity... <laughs> All the people coming here to all the new housing estates, which we're nearly meeting Danbury, we're nearly meeting Tottenham, we're nearly meeting Purley, these are going to be young couples who will want, not all old, we're not all geriatrics, a lot of us are in Malden, but we're not all old, we need the birth in place. But what my question to you is, £18 million seems 
a horrendous amount of money. I don't know how much a new hospital costs, but if you've got a fraction of that, repair what we have. And the other thing is, if the NHS don't own the land St Peter's is on, as I think, I can't remember who you said owned it, but you said it's owned, why, over 100 years, haven't they bought the land? Who buys a building without the land? It, all the money the NHS spends, it just doesn't seem, I don't know, it just doesn't seem right that you're spending this money, £18 million pound to, in repairs. I can't see where you can't just repair what we've got. Even if you take the back out, because we all know houses are going to go there. Everyone in Molden knows if St Peter's comes down, it's another housing estate. Let's not beat about the bush. The whole of Molden, we've lost everything that we had when I was a kid. It might be a long few years ago. The town is dying. We had a cinema, we had a police station, we had a hospital, um, a bus station, a swimming lake, everything we had with about four or five housing estates. We've now got thousands of housing estates and we've lost what we had. For God's sake, let's keep the hospital so the more people that are moving to the town can go there. I'm losing my voice now. That's all right. <sighs> keep going. Get... That's a good point. The more... <laughs> we'll keep... <laughs> thank you very much. Th thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There's a lot to unpack there, and thank you for sharing that with us. Regarding the hospital and the NHS, please, can uh, one of you respond? Press the red button to respond. Thank you. Thank you, and, and, and thank you for sharing that, uh, that with us. The estimated cost of making St Peter's Hospital uh, safe to use is an estimated cost. That £18 million is £18 million that we don't have. So we do not have capital monies. We do not have capital monies to renovate, repair, or replace St Peter's Hospital as it is. The monies that would be available would be monies if the owners of the site, Mid and South Essex Hospital and Essex Partnership, who own the land, they do own the land as well as the buildings. It would be capital monies that they would release from the sale of that site that would then go to fund the cost of providing the outpatient and the diagnostic services. Because any, because any facilities that we do identify will need capital money spending on them to bring them up to modern standards for delivering modern health care. But, but, but even if we did have that capital money available, I don't think that St Peter's Hospital, given the layout uh, that comes from it being a workhouse in the 19th century, could be refurbished to deliver modern services. And I, and I therefore think that, that, that we are looking at what Thank are the you. alternatives. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Siddle as well, please. Uh, I fully understand the residents' concern about the number of houses that have been built around the Malden area. And yeah, I live in the Tottenham area, so I, I know how the, the encroachment between the, the two parishes are between Haybridge and, and, and Tottenham. We are currently looking at our new local plan. And one of the things that, yeah, having got into politics only four years ago, probably by accident, uh, one of the things that I really want to do is ensure that we create a difference for Malden and in terms of the new local plan, that we ensure that we build houses in the right places for the right people. Thank you. And we ensure that in terms of what we've got to deliver, we have to meet our government targets. We Thank have you. to meet our government targets. As part of those options, we will go through a consultation with residents about where the houses will go in the future. OK, thank you. We'll move on to the next question. I know you've been standing for a while, then I'll come to this lectern here, please. Thank, thank you. you. Um, I just wanted to ask probably the councillor, um, all the houses that are going up, 
um, uh, which we all know that the house is going to go up, whatever. Why are we not getting the, um, the companies that are building these houses to have some of that land and build a clinic between them, a massive, great big clinic? That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Councillor Siddle. So there is a brand new clinic going into Haybridge, which will be completed in the next few years. But not big enough, is it, it uh, to hold all of these s services? That's the, the 80,000 people a year, or 800, whatever it says in here, um, the, um, that amount of people, I mean a really big, a, a big medical centre that all these lovely medical people can just transfer straight there. Uh, St I, Peter's I, help, hold on until then, and, and it's being built, and, and the people that are building the houses are funding it to be built. So the money, the money goes to Section 106 money, and that, some of that is allocated to health services. It is down to Essex County Council to deliver those services and, and to deliver that. Are they here? They're not, I'm afraid. Yeah. They're not, so, afraid. So, so those houses, but who gives the permission for those houses? So the, the houses are given permission. So we're not here to talk no, about... Like no, a no, no, no. no, but I'm saying that the, the houses... Are, so they're given permission to build those houses. Why are, they, why are they not given permission to build them on the proviso that they then build a, a, a unit? Uh, they, they've got their builders there on hand. It's not going to cost 18 million quid to build a, a unit that's for... A, for, clean, for to house the services that St Peter's, if they've already got the builders on site, is it? it it's all about where that site is then allocated to. And in, in terms of the allocated site, it didn't work, it hasn't worked out. We're not really, you know, in, in, terms of, in terms of that local plan you know, that we've got at the moment, that wasn't allocated in the right way. We're now ensuring, in terms of what we're doing at the council now, we're really looking at assets in the long term and looking at how we might work with the NHS in terms of so, assets. So they were given permission to build the houses on the proviso that they built a clinic, u, clinical unit, and now they're not. Is that what you mean? I, I can't go into the details because no. it's quite complex. <laughs> OK. Thank you very much. There's a bit of a back and forth on that issue. Sorry, Sir I, John. I, I, I'd just add to that. I mean, you're absolutely right. Um, that when we have large-scale development, we need to have infrastructure with it. And there is a system whereby developers make a contribution. And actually, within my area, um, there is the brand new Crouchvale medical facility that was paid for by Sainsbury's, who, when they were given permission to build a store there, equally the new Haybridge Health Centre is being financed in large part by the developers there. And the one thing... And this, as I say, no decision is taken, and that's the purpose of this evening. But if, if St Peter's were to close and that site be disposed of, then I would want to see, and I hope that the NHS will confirm, that the proceeds of any sale or any development there will be put into providing new facilities for the people of Malden. Right. Thank you. I'm going to take two or three from here because they've been waiting patiently, and then I'll come back to you, Judy. Please. Um, I, I might be saying some things which are a bit controversial, but I have read all of the consultation document on the Integrated Care Board website, and I think if I'm taking it all on board and believing and having faith in everything that we are being told within the consultation document, I can absolutely see the argument for saying that St Peter's in its current form is not fit for purpose and we need a new medical facility um, in Morden to provide all of the services that are currently provided there. I can see the rationale for saying that specialist services are delivered in units that provide that. It's like um, oncology, gynaecological services used to be within Mid-Essex. Well, now people go to Ipswich because they get better outcomes for the patients who need those services. So I'm getting all of that. But within the document on page... 69 of 84, um, down at the cool. bottom where it's saying the solutions we're exploring is to find other suitable accommodation for these services in and around Morden, including buildings that aren't at the moment um, used for said purposes of providing medical facilities. Um, and I've listened to what um, the leader of the council has said, and I don't mean to be rude to him, but I just think it, it, 
like some of the other people are just saying, it's a bit rich to be saying now, oh, here we are, we're the council, we, we're going to let you use our council officers' hub for these services, because to me these are all things that people should have been thinking about for an awful long time, knowing the state of St Peter's Hospital. But I, what, what I would really like to know is, if, if we're going to lose St Peter's, you must have some idea of said buildings, the hub, etc., etc. But what more at this stage can you tell, tell us about these places? The, the reason I'm saying this is I, I used to work for the NHS. I've worked at St Peter's Hospital on a geriatric ward. I've worked for the National Blood Service, and we, the transfusion centre, closed at Brentwood. We had to have services in other places, you know, and so. It's all doable, but where I'd like to know what are some of these places that you're pro proposing as well as the hub, because what does it mean for travel? Because as much as we've got young people, the truth is the people who use medical facilities predominantly are people of my age and people who are older, and travel and all of these things are much more difficult. And there was an accident on the bypass a fortnight ago, and more than virtually grand, ground to a, a halt. You couldn't get anywhere. It was gridlock. So I, I'd just like those questions answered, please. Thank Thank you very much. Thank you for your diligence and thank you for your work in the NHS. With Tr Tracy. Thank you. I think I'll start and I think also Dr Sweeting's also got some, some clinical views on, on what those options might be. So, so it, it's really good to hear from the leader of the council that you know, we can have some really detailed discussions about some of the other public sector buildings in Malden. We are looking, ideally, in Malden and the surrounding district, but, but you know, we see the sense of a hub in Malden, near to banks, near to shops, near to citizens' <laughs> advice. <laughs> I thought you were wrong, but the banks are going to He did say there was, he did say there was Barclays. <laughs> Sorry. Other, Sorry. Other banks are available than Barclays Thank that was you. mentioned earlier. Uh, well, Santander. Well, we, Santander. we've got a laugh tonight. I wasn't expecting that, but there you go. You. The good people of Walden have a sense of humour. Um, fantastic. So, so, so looking for somewhere with other facilities that people use, there have also been conversations about should we be looking at locating things like physiotherapy with leisure centres and, 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 and where people can go and use gyms and, and promote active and more healthy lifestyles. So that's something for us to look at. Should we be looking at, at local libraries and any space that's available there, again, around co-locations? We want to hear where you think those facilities, those buildings might be. We know that we will be spending some money to make them fit for delivery of good health care services. Please. So, Please. so we, we want to hear from you. Maybe there's an empty bank from the, the, the laugh that went around, around the room. So... So, so part of what we want in this consultation is, is to hear from people what are those proposals. Now, I know Dr Sweeting also has some views about uh, how we should locate and co-locate services, so perhaps I'll hand over to Dr Sweeting. Thanks for the question. I think you've summarised it quite helpfully. There are specialist services where we feel that um, a hub centre uh, will provide uh, the best care available in modern facilities. And then very much the move of the NHS is to provide local services for local people. But you have to remember even in our, we've moved far more to virtual technology, we've moved to even something called virtual beds and our virtual hospitals as well. So we'll be able to do far more technology. Um, I think coming back to where and when and which buildings, as you've heard the sensitivities there, but also we are generally open to that for the consultation period. My part in that as the kind of chief medic is to make sure that the location and the co-location of services provide good medical outcomes. There are certain services that you need X and Y need to go together um, to, to make it an efficient service. And so there's a commitment from myself and, and my team to make sure whatever proposals come forward, we need to look not only at cost and just suitability, but of course co-location, co-design, and do, is it fit for purpose to deliver clinical services? But I think this is where we really want to hear from you because you, you've, you've got the ideas, you know the terrain far better than I do, and this is part of the consultation. Okay, thank you, Dr Sweeting. Um, Lady here, please. One more this side and then to, to the red. 
I can't be the only person here this evening that thought they were coming to a consultation. And there are two proposals for the Stroke Rehabilitation Unit and the intermediate care beds. And there is no provision for them staying at St Peter's. If I, if I ask for a show of hands from everybody here that would like those two facilities to stay in Malden at the St Peter's site, redevelop it, don't sell it, you will get almost everybody putting up their hand. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much for your point. Thank you. Gentlemen, please. I, I just wonder why the present site cannot be redeveloped, at least for the services, the outpatient ser services. Why can't we do that? Why can't we build a purpose-built unit on that site? So I think we do not have sufficient capital funds available in order to, to build a building from scratch on that site. So the only capital receipts we would have would be capital receipts from the sale of the St Peter's site. And that is not sufficient capital to build what is needed. And, and, and therefore we are looking at other alternatives. We do have alternative sites that are really good quality facilities to deliver that inpatient care. And, and, and the stroke rehabilitation is for the Please. whole of Mid and South Essex. And, and we can only spend the funding that is made available to us. So, so that option is not an affordable option for us. Outpatients from a derelict old building to another building, which is probably quite old and derelict, and you're going to have to spend the money there. It, it would be a significant amount of less money that we would have to spend to do that than to build a, a, a health centre from scratch. So why weren't we thinking about this 15, 20 years ago? So, so I think I can only apologise for decisions that were not taken in the past, you, and I can understand that frustration. Judy, thank you. Um, two, two areas I'd like to touch on. One is a straightforward question, and we've already touched on the number of houses being built. Can I ask what population figures that National Health Service used to predict its services? In the booklet, it seems to be focusing on current usage. Can we have assurances that you've use predictions five years, ten years, taking into account the housing developments on need? That's the first question. Th or 30, yes. That's the first question. So, yeah, Dr. Sweeting. Th thank you for that. So, um, you're correct. Some, some of the assumptions is said in the consultation look at current activity. We are very conscious, uh, and part of my role as the Chief Medical Officer is to look at population and population growth. Uh, and particularly in the Morden area, I know there is above population growth in, in parts of Essex compared to other parts of Essex. I also know that this area is ageing in terms of, no offence to the audience in any way at all, but that it is a slightly older population than some other parts of Essex. So I'm very conscious of population growth, particularly the growth in the oldest old population, and that feeds into all of our modelling, particularly in health services. Uh, and there's fundamental questions being asked in health at the moment and how we deliver modern health care with what we see as a change in demographic, so an ageing population, a reduction in birthing rate, uh, and then how we pivot to provide those kind of services that would have to be much more agile and flexible than how historic models have delivered. Because quite frankly, we don't have the beds and we will never have the amount of beds. And so we're looking at all of that in a grand picture, really, as part of, our, part of my role. I'm not 
sure you've answered my question in terms of uh, the, the forward forecasting. And, and it's also a great shame that we keep referring to the lack of money. And here I'm looking at uh, MP who's connected with the government. Um, that it's a great shame that we don't have the money to redevelop. My, my second question, if I may, it is such a... Uh, over the years that I've been alive, we've seen a whittling down of local community services turning into silos, um, uh, and they don't necessarily talk to each other. That's why this is such an exceptional occasion, perhaps. Um, for instance... Have you looked? There's, there's, a, there's the odd reference to it'd be easier travel uh, for many, and I'm thinking, really? Um, have you truly analysed the networking and transport needs and the feeding in to more uh, buses needed and all the rest of it? It seems very focused on the provision of um, pure medical professional uh, facilities, and I can understand that from your point of view. But I think from our point of view, we are wondering how far we've got to walk, how far we've got to take a bus, how far we've got to drive. Um, you know, it, it's the other way around. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice. Does anyone want to pick that up? Dr. Sweeten? Within the larger consultation document, um, you'll see in the annexes there their travel analysis as well as a quality analysis has been carried out. So clearly we think about that. I know as an older person doctor myself, that's very much the patients I deal with. It's all about care closer to home and uh, even sometimes coming up to Brimfield Hospital from Morden when you're, when you're older and it's difficult. I know that that is difficult as well. I, I can't answer the, the transport question per se, probably be better for my colleague, but I reassure you we have taken that into account. And when we go to our uh, system and our regional levels, there's a whole section on travel analysis, what that looks like, and how we think about the whole of our 1.2 million population, which this consultation uh, affects as well, but conscious very much for the people of Morden. And, and, and if I could just add, I think one of the things that comes out through a public consultation is the impact on people and people's concerns about how will they get to the different locations. And I think we are already hearing things from people around the two options around the different configuration of intermediate care beds from, from different parts of Mid and South Essex that we do need to do more work on to understand because it's only through hearing from people about what their experience would be with those two options that we can start to really evaluate those two options. And I very genuinely can say to you, we do not have a preferred choice of those two options and therefore the impacts and implications on people from different parts of Mid and South Essex is really going to play a significant part in that decision making. And I'll just close with a final point about the integration of um, considerations. From my own husband's point of view, it's so difficult for him to get blood tests and we're very grateful for what blood tests, but we also need the GPs and other people who can interpret those results. So, you know, the system needs to be brought back together like it used to be and not so siloed. That's my final point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good point. Tracy, do you want to pick that one up? Yes. Thank you. And, and, and I think if I could just say, I totally agree with that. And I know from a clinical perspective, the more that we can bring clinicians together around patients, the better and more seamless their care is. And that is something we would be looking to make as good as we can make with the options that are available to us. Thank you very much. Please. Um, hi. Um, I want to apologise for that first, in case I get a little bit of emotional. Um, Absolutely fine. So, Please. Sorry. Um, Please. Get out of my system. Um, so I will tell you, my name is Holly Fry, and I had the privilege, the absolute privilege, of having my little boy this year at St Peter's Hospital, by these midwives. Oh, We've got Sarah RJ, I've got Ali down here. They were phenomenal, because do you know what? They made me feel like a person. I wasn't just a number. I've been to Brimfield throughout my pregnancy. I've also been to Braintree. I went this morning 
took me an hour and 10 minutes to drive there with my son in the back for an appointment. An hour and 10 minutes it took me to get there. What about those people in Burnham? What about those people in Tillingham? What about that risk? This is not a community of ageing people. This is a community of families. This is a community of people who have grown up here, who have lived here, who are now deciding to make their families here and grow their families. Sorry, can you take over? That's all right. Take your time. Please, please take your time. Sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I have been since... So, as I said, you said it's unsafe at St Peter's. That's, that were your words, unsafe. I felt the safest person in the world in those facilities. I managed. I, I, I was lucky enough to have a water birth. I had um, phenomenal midwives, as I said, phenomenal mid, mid, midwives. And I know they'll still be phenomenal if they aren't at St Peter's. However, that team, there's a bond there. You walk in there and you feel that safety around you. And as a first-time mum going into it, you, you're petrified. You don't know what you're walking into. I had times where I was in for my prenatal. I know Sarah RJ. Um, I was crying my eyes out. <laughs> um, but they made me feel safe. And knowing as well that that was where that I could have birth my child. You could go there. You could, you could, you had, I had to look around. I knew exactly what was happening at the time. I went to Broomfield. I was a number. I was in and out. I didn't even get a conversation. They wouldn't even wait at my 12-week scan for my husband to park the car, because he could not park the car. <laughs> How is that acceptable? How is that acceptable, you closing? And the thing is, their consultation, nowhere in there does it say there's another, oh, look, there's two options, which I think is ridiculous, giving two options for each one. <laughs> two options, what's that going to do? For you to say that you are closing St Peter's maternity and there's going to be no more births in Malden is an absolute travesty. It should not be happening. It shouldn't even be a discussion. The birthing unit is a vital part of this town and it needs to stay here. Not in Braintree, not in Broomfield. I'll ask the question now. Thank yeah. you very thank you. Oh, so no, much. no, I, well, I do want to ask a question. I've got one more oh, question. Go on, go on. <laughs> Come on. The emotion is gone. Sorry. Postpartum and all. Um, my next question is, is this morning, whilst I was sitting in traffic outside Braintree this morning, I was sitting there in traffic, late for my appointment, my um, physio doctor, um, pelvic floor doctor was waiting for me, trying to phone me, and because I was obviously in traffic, I wasn't in my appointment on time. As I stand there, I saw, and I looked out the right of my window, sorry, I will get to the point. Um, <laughs> I stand outside my window, and I saw um, St Michael's Old Hospital, the old one that looks exactly like St Peter's. <laughs> exactly like St Peter's, and I was like, hang on a minute, that's a housing development. What's next door? Oh, a brand new community hospital. So why can't that happen here in Malden? Why can't that happen here? You have set a president. You have set a president by doing it in Braintree. Why can't it be done in Malden? You are going to be moving and palming us off to already oversubscribed services over the county. So why can't you do that, what you have done in Braintree, and do it here in Malden? Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Sorry. Thank you very much for sharing that with us and feeling OK. To, it's, that was brilliant. But there's some good points in there. Could someone take that? Uh, yeah, I'll take this. Deborah. Thank you. And um, some really valid points there. And I totally get the emotion. Um, historically, since we've been on this journey, our staff that work at St Peter's have had their babies there, their sisters, their mothers, their families. I totally get that. What I want to be really clear on is we are only talking about labour care. And when I say only, I'm not dismissing it because obviously that's the end goal. 
Um, but we will be keeping the local services, i.e. your antenatal care and all of those services local to the Morden area. We've been looking at different where we can have those. Um, but we are talking about relocating labour care to um, WJC. So from some... And you've got an extra 20 minutes to get on here. That's nearly, that could be a two hour travel. That you're putting babies and mums at risk. There is a risk. So I'm not sure if I wasn't very clear when I um, gave the background to this. So the reason that St. Peter's was qu closed quite a lot to intrapartum care is that we do not have a workforce to support because they get pulled to Broomfield. That's a lie. If you could that just is let, a lie. If they you could just, to Broomfield. If you could just let me finish. Excuse me. So, sorry, sorry. Please. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. So the reason that we made, we were working towards this decision is because the closure of St Peter's all the time. And I'm really glad that you were able to have that experience because for you, when you went into labour, it was open. For a lot of women, birthing people in the area, they've not been able to access services for intrapartum care. I do understand about the travel. It's one of the things we looked at. We looked at in consultation with our staff as well, with them moving over there. And we do acknowledge that, and we've taken that into consideration. Um, and I don't want to be dismissive of what you're saying by any means, but geographically around the country, there will be pregnant labouring women that do have to travel a distance to get to a maternity unit. Okay. okay, okay no, I understand that, but I just want to say that you're, you're taking away... You're taking away what we've already got. You're not, you're not like, it's, it's not like you've gone, it's not a luxury to us. This isn't a luxury having a maternity unit here and a label ward. It's a necessity. So, yeah. Can I just come in? Yeah. Sorry, right. can I just right. come in with last, one last thing? The thing we need to consider as well is about um, home births for, for the women around St Peter's. Um, you, you could dismiss it. So a woman who's having a low-risk uh, low birthing labour in the birth centre... A majority of those women could quite safely deliver at home, but they would like to be in the, you know, the long standalone birth centre. Um, but all of the antenatal and postnatal care will be kept within local services. It's just the labour care that we are discussing today. And it's really helpful for me to listen to your journey and your experience, and that's what we want to listen to tonight. Thank you for sharing. We're going to move to some other people as well, but thank you very much for... Um, I, do you want me to just come in? I'll oh, just sorry. respond very quickly to, to Holly, just on the... Um, there. Holly, I want to say look, thank you, for, first of all, for really uh, giving a big shout-out to our NHS staff who cared for you, and I'm really proud to hear that they cared for you and cared for you so well. I completely understand the ethos of a team and how close-knit the team are, and I very seem to see that very much in... Uh, our intermediate care beds as well as our midwifery service. It, it wouldn't be right for me to say though as, as the chief medical officer is that my job is to look at outcomes and the safest possible care. Um, More than delivered about 77 babies uh, last year, 140 or so the year before here in Morden. Uh, um, we, we know that 40% of, of women will need specialist care, so specialist care in large hospitals because of high-risk pregnancies. And so I have to take that into consideration and my clinical colleagues need to take that into consideration when we are providing services which have a, uh, not only a workforce constraint but also to deliver and to deliver healthy babies for our population as well. And that's fed into some of this con consultation. So complete... complete I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely right, you're growing, but, but even better for me to then stand up to say, I want to give you the best services within the region to make sure our outcomes for our mums and our babies are the best. Okay, thank you. Um, gentleman has been waiting patiently Hi. there. Thank you, sir. Right. Hi, um, I came with an open mind tonight because I thought it was a consultation, and you started quite well on page three saying how you mentioned community hospital, at least in two of the sections, and then you go on further and, and remind me that People over a certain age, as you've said also recently, um, require more community support. And then I go to the final page, six and seven, and I find that you're talking both options are Brentwood and Rochford. How on earth is that a community hospital? Have you ever driven from, from uh, Burnham out to those places? It is not a community hospital. That is absolutely so. So we're actually given no choice at all. All right? And further... <laughs> I mean, people have talked about redeveloping the site. No, I don't know if anyone said 
fine, sell half of it and build the hospital with the rest of the money. So you get some of the funding. But um, you've then carried on talking about communities and you say, it's on this consultation, it's our responsibility to, to tell you where you're going to put your services. I've never heard anything so ridiculous in my life. I'm in electronics. I would never ask you to tell me which facility I should base my factory. <laughs> you're, you're setting us up to fail again because no one here knows that solution. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your questions. Um, Tracy. Thank you. <laughs> so just to be clear, we're not asking you to tell us where to put the facilities. We're asking you your views. It's, it's, it's our responsibility to make those decisions. What we're asking you is for your views and your proposals so that we can take your views into account and so that we can ensure that the viable proposals that come forward can be considered in light of the views of yourselves and the other populations impacted across Mid and South Essex. That's what we're doing. Okay, thank you. Lay here, please. Before asking you questions, there's one thing I think might be helpful for you to know. I, this summer, have visited friends in Broomfield, and you said that St. Peter's was not safe and fit for purpose. <laughs> well, the, the, the one person in the one ward that stands out in my mind at Broomfield had all of the electrics in her room go wrong so that we were afraid to touch anything. They had to get electrical cables in to hook up her machines. And I was actually f fearful of leaving my friend in that ward at Broomfield. But that's separate to the questions I have to ask you. First of all, I'd like to know if any consultation has taken place in Billericay, in Halstead, in any of the places listed in your literature today that you would like to farm out services to, to see if they can cope with additional patients being brought in. The second question I'd like to ask you is, why, knowing what dreadful, dreadful transportation problems arise, the Chalmer Valley Park and Ride going to Broomfield, one of the only rays of happiness in the whole situation, <laughs> was closed yeah. down so that visitors and staff alike would have to pay for parking at Broomfield. And the third question I have is, I'd like the panel to tell the audience here, over Mid-Essex, not just one hospital, how many millions are made by private companies who are entrusted with parking at these hospitals? And if you're short of money to redevelop in Malden, why aren't these millions being brought into play here? Okay, there are three questions there. We'd like to take them. Thank you, and well put. Thank you uh, for the question. I, I, I'm generally sorry to hear about the Broomfield experience, uh, very much so as well. Uh, obviously, as you know, I, I clearly still work there. Um, the additional beds, so the beds uh, around the system, I think from the consultation it's clear there was a net increase in our intermediate care beds, so in our bed base overall, with a big increase in our stroke beds. That is the most, that's the most critical part of this consultation. We've seen from our demographics and our stats and our projections that we need more rehabilitation stroke beds. And in fact, part of, the, uh, of our proposals would be, we've already increased those, but to increase them even more, up to nearly the 50 number. And that's important with our growing population and their needs. Intermediate care beds, we are talking about right sizing those, they're the rehabilitation, um, and being spread out across our 1.2 million population. As I said, around 2,000 people or so would be needing those. Um, in terms of car, 
car parking. Um, it, it's difficult for me to answer, person, because I, I, I am, as I said, I'm, I'm the integrated care medical director. I, I, I'm not on the director board for the hospital. Uh, as you know, for a significant amount of time, uh, that, that didn't charge. But I know parking whenever I'm there and I work there. Um, I know my car's been clanged in the car park. My wife has scraped the car down one of the, the walls recently as well. So I completely appreciate the parking issue. And I know my patients suffer for it because they also relate to my outpatient appointments. That's, that is an ongoing issue. But difficult for me to comment on from a, from a hospital point of view. But okay. perhaps an administrator might be able to answer those questions. Um, let me just try and deal with a couple of points. Um, I'm not an administrator, but I, I first, hearing your experience in Broomfield is obviously very worrying for you and your friend. I would say, when people have bad experiences in Broomfield, they do often write to me, and I take it up with Middlesex Hospitals. But I also do believe that the vast majority have very good experiences in Broomfield and the quality of care is very good, but obviously sometimes things go wrong and I'm always willing and happy to take up a case where something has gone wrong. The issue about the park and ride, um, unfortunately I don't think Essex County Council are here, but that is something which I would like to see continue. Um, it has operated quite effectively and also, I mean I've worked with Arrow and the Denji Dart to try and make sure that there are facilities for transport, for instance from the Denji Peninsula to get to Broomfield. So we need to look at a variety of options. Um, and then on the parking charges, I mean, I know the difficulty of parking Broom in Broomfield. I've been treated in Broomfield, and it is extremely difficult. A lot of the money, the vast majority of the money raised goes into Broomfield. They own the site, obviously. Um, the operator takes some uh, proportion for running the service, but it, it's not all being siphoned off into a private company. It is money that goes into the NHS. And then what about fines that are related to the parking at Colchester Hospital. Those I know run into the millions. I'm afraid I can't talk for the fines in the Colchester that Hospital, but I'm very, but I'm very happy to, to, actually, I'm very happy to when I go away and if you send me a note to just give me your name and address, I'll get you an answer. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for waiting patiently and good questions. We might step forward, thank you. I've lived in Malden the majority of my life. Um, I feel lucky to say that. As a child, I remember being able to... Uh, my mother helped out at the hospital. There used to be a community area outside, actually maternity services, which were for older people. Um, I've been lucky to work there as an occupational therapist. Um, I've worked on the wards. I've worked on the stroke unit. I also have worked in the community therapy services. I've treated children there as a paediatric therapist. So I've actually treated the children for this area locally to them so from a transport point of view it absolutely worked to a treat and I saw those people regularly there is a base and I've also used St Peter's as a service user one person okay this is my experience as one person my services I've used my mother has had outpatient appointments there we use the excellent maternity services you've talked about today um, with the care that like no other place I know the expertise and the love and the support that comes from the maternity services at St Peter's has absolutely always excelled. In fact, the first night of my life as being a mother, I was lucky enough to stay in the parent room with my husband and my newborn son, and I prov they provided excellent care for me. I mean, what an amazing experience for that. I also... Um, I've had outpatient appointments for physio, audiology, neurological issues, x-ray, paediatricians I've seen as a service user. I've seen my gastro team there. I've had scans. I've seen people for, with difficulties with learning disabilities and even podiatry. Those services, a fantastic spread of services, okay? Now, even, the, even regularly now, we use the blood service. Now, the blood service is absolutely fantastic. They work like Trojans there. They work from 7.30 in the morning until at least half past three, five days a week, and they are chocker. They do not have gaps. So I want to know when you're looking for a site or a, a hub or a different building. It's very nice that you're talking about lending us the the uh, Morden District Council offices, that's already a police station, that's already other used for other, a bank, that's already used for that. So where is there one building just to provide enough services for the blood tests alone? That's what I don't understand when you're talking about this. 
So I can't see, for all those different services, under one umbrella, and that's just myself, one service user, and I've used all of those at least. I'm sure there's more that I can't even think about. But as a consultation, it seems to me that the plan for you is actually to reduce services. It's not to provide services, and it's not to continue to provide services to the community. What you're planning to do is to reduce the services that are available to us. Um, and for an enormous growing population, I don't understand how that can make any sense, personally. So my question to you is, why are you not listening to us? Why are you not listening to the people in this room? You're saying... You're saying you want our suggestions and our ideas about where to go. People are telling you what they want. They want St Peter's. They want you to improve the services there. They want you to spend the money so that you have your hub. You've already got a hub. You don't need to have five, 15 different hubs doing so many different services because it's disjointed. It doesn't work. It hasn't worked in any other area that, it, that you've done that to. So my question to you is, why are you not listening to the people in this room? OK. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Tracy, please. Thank you. We are listening. That's, that's, why, that's why we're here. That's why we're doing all of the other meetings. That's why we're asking people to, to write to us, to phone us. We are listening. We've not yet made decisions. And we want to take that feedback into that decision making. Thank you. Thank you. Shame on you. This has been going on. St Peter's should have had funding for the last 30 years. And you have happily ignored it. I've worked there. I've seen what it's like. And you have happily ignored it for a very, very long period of time. And now, suddenly, you're walking away from it. And I think that's absolutely disgusting. You shame on you. Shame on you. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen here, please. Yeah, um, question for Dr. Sweeting first. Uh, you, you mentioned um, on your statistics, 70 babies were born in Malden, I think was what you said. So one and a half a week, something like that. But if you're turning them away at the door... <laughs> so, just to, just to put it in perspective, there's a new school being built here that feeds into the plume, the local school. That, that's where we are here now. Um, intake here is over 300 a year. So, that's literally just sort of from the Molden town. Then we've got Ormiston over um, um, in um, Burnham, similar numbers. So, the figures don't sort of seem to really quite add up. Yeah, I can happily say th thanks for coming back on me on that. You're, you're right, these are pure hard figures, say 77 births for last year, 144 the years before. But of course that, that takes into account that Morden was intermittently open and closed because of staffing levels. So you're completely correct that those, those are factual numbers. Um, but so, so comes, and my colleague will come in, so comes our dilemma of, of, of the challenge of the workforce as well. Okay, thank you. Right, thank you. That interjection, can you just finish there? So, for Sir John, um, who you, you stood for our, as our MP under Boris Johnson last election. <laughs> thank you. And, and who then, a few years previous, stood in front of a bus, 350 million a week, I think, was going to be extra funds going to the NHS. That equates to about 18 billion, I believe, in a year. I realise that's a drop in the ocean, but that's thousand times what is required for St Peter's. So where is it actually going? Well, I, I, I don't want to revisit the bus argument, but actually it is going into the NHS, and the amount of money going into the NHS actually is more than that. But the, the, the difficulty, firstly, across the whole of NHS expenditure is that the demand is rising relentlessly um, and has outpaced 
the extra money that has gone in. And that has been a problem not just in the last five years, ten years. It's probably been for the last 30, 40 years. Um, but the one thing I did, and the gentleman down here made a very fair point about, you know, why is it that suddenly this has arisen? Why didn't we actually think about it earlier and start doing something about it? I have been talking about a replacement or a new facility in Malden for as long as I can remember. I mean, Tracy hasn't been chief executive for long, and Richard said he'd only been in politics for four years. I've been representing this town a long time. And you know, I, can, I can take you to the sites that were considered. There was one south of the bypass by the original um, primary care trust. There was a site on Wick Hill, which we thought we got, um, and then the money for a road proved impossible to raise. This has been an ongoing uh, frustration, and I have been consistently told oh, no, we're making real progress. This time we've got an outlying business case. This time we're going to deliver it. And for 20 years, we kept being promised, and it hasn't happened. And if one thing comes out of this consultation and tonight's meeting, indeed, is that we must have a new health facility in Malden. And that is what I will go on fighting for. One more, yeah? One more? You've got one more question? Oh, I'm done. All right, thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. So, excuse me. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. Uh, can I introduce myself first of all? I'm Dr. David Wilkin. I'm a senior researcher, and I was a member of the a public member of the Malden Hospital health hub, whichever, stakeholder board from 2012 to 2018, so prior to COVID. Uh, I have worked on that stakeholder board, which has now been dissolved, um, with uh, members of the Morden District Council, with NHS England, with NHS uh, Mid-Essex Commissioning Group as it was. I met Sir John on a few occasions to discuss this. I have colleagues in the crowd that have all worked together for a new hub for Morden. When I could get to my GP surgery, which I haven't been to for six years, even though I've only got two chronic conditions. When I could get into my, get across the drawbridge, um, one of the former GPs there, lovely woman, Linda Brown, said when she arrived in Malden, when she arrived in Malden in 1988, the first thing she was told was, don't worry, there is a new hospital just around the corner. <laughs> 1988. Sir so John, you've been in your role since 1997, I believe. I Actually, watched... 1992. Was it really? You should be due for a pension very soon. Perhaps it will come in October. Um... <clears throat> anyway, whilst I was on that stakeholder board, and I will come to a very succinct question, which will probably be a breath of fresh air for you. When I was uh, working on that board... Um, with lots of winning volunteers, giving up much of their time. We saw, uh, in those seven years, we saw the project restart four times. Each time it was allocated a quarter of a million pounds of public money. Each time a former NHS project manager was allocated, nobody from outside, nobody from outside at all, a former NHS project manager was allocated, I was attending meetings, I saw latterly Councillor Fluker appear at meetings and then walk away. I saw other councillors appear and walk away. I saw NHS England representatives not bothered to turn up. I saw uh, clinical commissioning group members not bothered to turn up. I did have meetings with Sir John on two or three occasions. And bless you, Sir John, but you weren't a great deal of help. But, <laughs> um, but this is an election year, so things might improve. Um, and do you know, the lack of commitment in those meetings was blindingly obvious from Malden District Council, from the various NHS representatives, uh, and from other local dignitaries that were supposed to attend those meetings and didn't bother. In fact, the only people who had the guts and the courage to turn time and time again are my co colleagues in this room tonight, because we were passionate we wanted a hospital. So we cared. So my question to you, and it's a sink sink one, is are we getting the service we deserve from you? Thank you. Thank you. A long intro. Let, let me just Thank come you back for your question. Quickly on. Just start, I, Sir John. I, 
I mean, you, you articulate the frustration, which I completely share, because I have been having those meetings, I have been having those discussions, and it is a matter of real anger to me that you know, other parts of the county have seen uh, new facilities provided, and we have kept on talking about it and being told, yes, as you rightly say, um, assurance is being given that we're on the brink of getting a new hospital, but it's never come to it. At one point, I don't know if before Richard Siddle took over the district council, at one point the district council was going to build a new hospital, um, and that was explored at some considerable length. So there have been plans over and over again, um, and they have not been delivered. Um, and now, I am determined that, as I said earlier, if anything good comes out of this, that we should finally actually see a building take place, a new facility, um, to serve the people of Malden, rather than going on talking about it for another 20 years. Sorry, any other comments from the panel? Or on the, on the, okay, uh, sorry, Dr yeah, Sweeting. I, I think it's, I know this won't satisfy, but, but we are all clinicians here, all, all three of us from the NHS, and um, we've all do either doing, done clinical jobs or doing clinical jobs, and we passionately do care. And in fact, the reason I got into this role is to provide high quality care and look at our population as a whole. Uh, and so I just want to plead personally that I certainly do care, but we are having to make challenging decisions uh, with a challenged financial envelope and to provide best quality care, and we have to look at the whole arena, the whole of our 1.2 million population. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sweeting. Please, your questions. Thank you. I accept that they're challenging decisions, and those challenges largely come because government are underfunding the NHS. So, Mr. Whittingdale, what are you doing to ensure we have sufficient staff, especially midwives, to staff any new facilities? And how did Braintree and Brentwood both get funding for their new hospitals and Malden hasn't? Well, I, I completely agree with you about Braintree uh, and Brentwood. Uh, and that is something which, you know, I mean, I think Malden has been overlooked to some extent, and that is something but that you I will get... But you were a politician yeah, during and, and, that and, time. And, and I promise you, I've been telling them that for a long time, and I still believe that actually Malden, not just in terms of the NHS, is too often, you know, we're the smallest district in Essex, somehow we get uh, overlooked, and that is something which I find deeply frustrating, and I will go on making the case to Essex County Council and to the government, and I will take this from here and take it to Parliament if necessary. Um, if necessary, it is necessary. Well, I, 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 I mean, that, I, I do think there is a case for the government focus, but I'm, I don't want to get into the overall question of funding of the NHS, but I, don't, I would dispute whether or not the government has underfunded it. The NHS will always need more money, however much any government puts into it. It always needs more money. I actually think there is a case for more fundamental look at the way in the NHS operates and its funding. Maybe that's an argument we'll have when the general election arrives. It's not one for tonight. But I know there are serious problems I utterly accept that need to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Good questions. Thank you. Good evening. I was a member of the patients group at Longfield and our chairman said that when you build 50 houses, you have to pay 166,000 into the NHS for new facilities. But if you build 49, you do not have to pay it. So therefore, the developers do phase one, phase two, phase three, no money to the end. I want that confirmed, please. Is that true? Well, thank you for your question. <laughs> Uh, I, we, I don't have the calculations here. I don't, I don't know whether Councillor Siddle well, has them Well, why is it not being brought up in Parliament? So, well, I, I, don't think it, I don't think it's as simple as that, and, and Richard will be able to say a little more about the way in which developers, I... developers are required to make a contribution, not specifically, but, if, I mean, there is a discussion takes place about a variety of things, like, for instance, the provision of a new primary school or new road transport, but certainly health facilities well, come I'd to Well, I'd like that confirmed please, because I understood it was for the NHS. That's what our chairman told me at Longfield, if the you, patients group. If you send your details to me, 
and send that question to me. I will find out and I will come back to you. Right. Thank you. My second question is this. I'm obviously over 80 and I have a medical condition which requires constant treatment, unfortunately, and I have to have neck surgery. Now, Broomfield has lost it because it's not its centre of excellence. The centre of excellence is now the Queen's in Romford. I live on the Dengie. Now, it requires me to, when I get an appointment, to see a consultant. He will decide when I have it. I have to be in at 7 o'clock in the morning for the surgery. I then have to get myself home. I live alone in a rural village where the other people are all about my age, and most of us are local drivers. So how do I get my treatment? And this is going to make it even worse, because I was offered... Um, Adam Brooks and I was offered Queen's. Now, both I've had to refuse because I can't get there. It's impossible. And there's no provision in this for services on the dengue. We need... You can't... You're talking about all this. There's no infrastructure being talked about it. All these hubs. How do we get to these hubs from the dengue? OK. Good question about the transport links, which I think have been touched on. Um, Dr. Sweeting. Thank you uh, for the question. I'm, I'm sorry to hear about your neck problem that, result, that requires surgery as well. Uh, there is a general move, as you know, and I've mentioned before, for specialist services within the NHS. Uh, I'd imagine probably what you're speaking about is something called neurosurgery. They're provided at specialist neurosurg neurosurgical centres by trained staff with highly important techniques. This requires scale, so it needs a workforce, it needs expertise, um, and it needs expert recovery. Uh, this is obviously specialised services. As you probably know, even here in Essex, if you were to have a heart attack, you would often be blue-lighted. If, if, if the ambulance crew found you to have a certain type of heart attack, you would bypass Broomfield Hospital and go straight to our cardiothoracic centre, our centre of excellence, to treat heart attacks as quickly as possible as well. So medicine is moving more and more with the high-tech nature of it to provide specialist services. Completely, completely understand about the longer travel times for those specialist services. But I hope you see that we are committed to providing the best outcomes for you to retain your independence and your mobility. I think what we're talking about in the consultation is more generalist services, in, particularly in terms of rehabilitation, which wouldn't require that, that an amount of specialist expertise. Um, but I think we are always trying to balance specialist high quality need with local services uh, that can be provided by a generalist workforce. Thank you. Um, gentleman here, please. Uh, good evening. You look like you're enjoying yourself. Um, <laughs> the, my question's about the uh, alternative buildings. So y you said you've got a few. Are we allowed to know what they are, where they are? So I think we've heard from Councillor Siddall that the mm -hmm. district council's wanting to have conversations with us about other council facilities, public sector buildings that, that we could work with them on. Uh, I, we do not have a list of buildings. I'm not keeping a list secret from you. We don't have a list of buildings. What we're asking people is, what are the buildings that you know are available within Malden that we could then have conversations about? So, so there isn't a secret list. We're seeking, we're seeking okay. proposals from people about that facility. So, sorry. Excuse me. Okay. Okay. Please. So Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, do you have a supplementary, sir? Huh? You want another question? Oh, yeah. Yeah, go on. So, are they going to be in Molden, or are you going to look for somewhere specifically in Molden, or does it not matter really where it's going to be? That we are specifically looking in Malden and, and the Malden district, but we really would like there to be a facility that is in the town. And is this going to be a building that's temporary or permanent? So, so we would like it to be a, a permanent 
building for these services, not a temporary building. And, and, and we will make available capital monies to refurbish that building so that it is suitable for healthcare services. So, Councillor Siddle, so you're pre they're prepared to give Moulton District Council building over as a permanent building? At, at this stage, we, we can't say what will happen. However, what does happen and what we want to do with the NHS and work with the NHS is for long-term facilities. It's, there is no point in doing anything in the short term. At this stage of the consultation, in this stage of in terms of our discussion with the NHS, it is very early stages. However, one of the things that I know that the NHS was one of the things that as as, as, as a council and also Sir John is, is, is really concerned about is until we have those things in place, things should stay in St Peter's. And that's, that's the crucial element. And it's about making sure that process works effectively. And that's where us and the NHS can do that, is to ensure that the services and the facilities and those, the, the care for residents in Malden stays in Malden and stays in Malden for the long term. These are not short-term aims. They are long-term aims. And in terms of the future... If, I, if, if we as district councillors can ensure, and I know all my fellow district councillors, and some of them are here tonight, are really passionate about this and see the importance of this. So we need to ensure that wherever possible, we also look for a long-term solution in terms of medical facilities. At this stage, that's even further down in terms of, of where we might be. But those are the discussions that we're having with the NHS. And as I said in terms of my opening statement, they're commercial sensitivity at the moment. So we, we can't really... I'd love to say, oh, this is going to happen, but we're not at that stage yet. But, as, but we, we will do our utmost at the District Council to ensure that we work with the NHS to ensure that services stay in Malden. Um, the District Council, when they uh, had a report done for building their new offices, wasn't one of the purposes for building a new office was because that, uh, the, the building they're in now has issues for sustainability? So, so like St Peter's, part of our building is Victorian and was, uh, was uh, actually a children's home. So, so, no, so no, some of it is Victorian. Some of that building is Victorian. When I was 70 years old and when I was a child, that was the thing. It is, excuse, me, excuse me, can I have one question at a time, please? So it is, is, I can yourself, assure you. you that it is Victorian. It was a children's home at one particular time. Okay. So, so in terms of your question, in terms of your question, yes, the building, if we, that building does need investment, <laughs> but it's a, it's the sort of question that we need to look at with the NHS to see whether it is sustainable. So that is the sort of thing that's going on at the moment. Okay, thank you very much for your time. There's lots of people waiting here and conscious. The gentleman in the striped shirt, please. Good evening. Um, I'd just like to say, I think we, we think it's totally unprofessional of you to come to this meeting saying you're going to shut St Peter's Hospital when you have no firm plans of what to do with outpatients and things like that. You're asking the audience where they think buildings are. That's totally unprofessional. You've got to, you cannot go making statements like you're going to shut St Peter's before you've looked at the alternatives. You should be sitting here telling us what you're going to do. You have no idea what you're going to do with the outpatients. That's, that's totally unprofessional. And you've had years and years to sort it out. So I think you'll find that the majority of the people here are here because they don't trust you. They think you're going to sell, you're going to sell St Peter's. You're, you're going to sell St Peter's and that money's going to disappear. Now, you made a statement just now that capital funding would be made available if you found a building in Malden, and yet you said you had no capital funding to fund the re repairs to St Peter's. Now, that makes sense to me, or anybody here, I don't think. But anyway, that's my question. You cannot shut St Peter's before, one, you've, you've got the other property sorted out and two you've got them up and running and then we might let you shut St Peter's but not until then. 
Okay, sir. Thank you. Dr. Sweeting, you want to just respond on that? I think, um, as we've said before, if, if St. Peter's was to be sold, the capital investment from that, and the, the trust is clear of that, would be used to invest into local services, as we've talked about. I think our teams are actively involved with discussions, and that, as we've heard, there's commercial sensitivities around providing outpatient facilities, including bloods, uh, physiotherapy, uh, at the moment. Um, and we certainly do have ideas for things. This is a consultation, and, and this is the purpose of this as well to hear. Uh, I do believe we, we are in those discussions, and we have got clinical dialogue there as well. So I, I do want to reassure you, we are very much in those discussions at the moment. And I also want to repeat what I said at the opening um, presentation to you. We will not be closing the outpatient services at St. Peter's until there is an alternative facility um, for those services to move into. And I do give you that assurance today. Okay, thank you, thank you for that uh, response. Uh, lady here, please. Hello. Um, I am one of the midwives who serves the Denji area, and I know that a lot of my ladies are very worried about having to travel so far. Lots of them don't drive. But I am also really frustrated in the fact that in a lot of the correspondence that I've read, it says that they'll receive better and outstanding care at WJC. Can I just say that at St Peter's, we provide really good, safe and outstanding yeah. care. Yeah. 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 The building might be old, but the care is second to none. Um, also, just to point out that the WJC um, unit is great, the staff are fantastic, however they do have less postnatal beds um, than St Peter's, they only have three, St Peter's could provide up to seven, if not more, and with the growing population and trying to get people to go there, that is going to have a massive impact, um, therefore it's also not really taking the pressure off Broomfield either. Um, this number six gets used a lot, I know the other gentleman touched on it, um, but I think some of that is down to the fact that we were close for 22 nights in June last year, and that is going to impact our, our birth rate. And that's down to staffing at Broomfield, yeah. not at St Peter's. The pre-COVID, our numbers were pretty good. Obviously, COVID affected everybody's lives, and then post-COVID, we were close an awful lot. So any figures you do see, please do take them with a little pinch of salt. Um, the question that I actually had was... Um, in, when Boris Johnson, the Tory party, in the manifesto, he promised 50 new hospitals. Why can't St Peter's be one of them? Thank you. Thank you for your work at St Peter's. And okay. over to Sir John, I think, perhaps to start the answer on that one. Well, I am absolutely determined, as we discussed earlier in the afternoon, in the evening, that whatever the outcome of the consultation, there should be a new facility for health provision in Malden. Um, when it comes to the, the, the new hospitals, there are new hospitals being built. Um, it is the case that one of the um, consequences of the options under discussion is that if St Peter's were sold, then that provides the money to invest in a new facility in Malden. Um, and it could also be uh, topped up through development contribution, which we've also talked about. But we haven't reached that point yet. That decision has not yet been taken. But whatever is the outcome, it must include a new health provision uh, in, to ensure that the people of Malden still are able to obtain uh, outpatient services here and not have to travel to a different part of the county. Can I just ask, does that also include... Um, new maternity services so that the Denji women and the women of Malden and the women of the Essex area will have the choice because we always talk and we was always trained about women's choice in maternity. The choice is taken away. So does that new facilities, will it include more delivery rooms so that we can provide women with their choice of birthing yeah, areas in the, local, in the area. local area? We also just, sorry, I know you guys are not all maternity, but we are really, really passionate about St Peter's and the maternity care that we give to St Peter's and the women in the Denji area as well as Malden. We are not allowed now to give all of these ladies postnatal care, even though they've taken away all of our labour care, 
We are not allowed also to give postnatal care. So the breastfeeding support that we used to give is no longer available. My colleague here, um, she had to have her baby up at Broomfield Hospital. She was left in a side room, and she is a member of staff. She was left in a side room with no support. When she wanted to go to WJC for breastfeeding support, she was told there is not enough room for her to come because they do not have the facilities at WJC. I love my student, my colleagues over there, but they do not have the facilities to provide the care for our women. It's a shame we can't still give that right now. Sorry, I'll, I'll, sorry, I'll let... We are uh, right now. And yeah. we're, we're safe during the day, but we're not safe yeah. at night. And but we we've been told that. that the building is not safe to be open overnight to provide care, but we're allowed to stay open in the daytime to provide care. <laughs> Can someone I mean, tell me the okay. answer to that one, please? <coughs> sorry. Okay, Lots sorry. Thank you. Respond. Thank you. I'm also, just before the response, I'm conscious of the time and I'm conscious that a lot of people have been standing and to be quite honest, the questions asked tonight have been fantastic and tremendous, but I'm conscious of people's time and especially to the people who've been standing here. So what I'm going to do is say, after the garbage, and reflect to my colleagues who are councillors, I think the, the responses and questions we've had here certainly reflect the diversity of the people that are here and obviously if they want to follow up with people that are connected or are on the stage here, I'm sure they can do at a later date, but I'd just like to make sure you all get home safely and all been patient, and thank you again for coming out, but we'll stop after the gentleman with the anorak and the lady with the pink jumper, please. So, yeah, go on, you ask the question. Yeah. Answer the question. Debbie. Sorry, thank, please. Thank you. Some really good questions there and quite a lot. So I've written down some notes. I'll try to get to all of them. Um, firstly, I want to apologise to you if you've been made to feel that the midwives at WJC are better than you. And I will take that back with the team and we will learn from that because this was never our intention. We would never want to make you feel like that. So I put it on record, but I do apologise for that. So um, in terms of safety around why it's not open at night to interpartum care, we don't have the soft FM at night now like what we did. Sorry, FM. Um, in, and what I mean by that is the cleaners to come in and clean a delivery room, catering. We do. We. Sorry. Can I just can I just Hold get to second, some of the points because there's quite a lot and I'm conscious of the time. So we can't have labouring women being there till six o'clock at night and say, well, actually, we need to move you off to another site now. So um, that's how I'm going to respond to that. And I'm really disappointed to, to hear that you can't get breastfeeding support at WJC. As far as I was aware, we were continuing to offer um, all of the outpatient activity, daytime activity at St Peter's in terms of breastfeeding support. So I will need to go back and look at why we're not... They've only got three beds, and two of them are labour beds. So even if you're staying on the postnatal, sorry, the postnatal ward at WJC, it's not a ward, it's a room. Sorry, if you need to use the bathroom, you have to go into one of the labour rooms to use the bathroom. So what I meant by that, and I'm sorry if I caused yeah, confusion, fine. was that we should be up. My my perception was that we were still offering that at St Peter's because women could come in during the day and have that breastfeeding support. So they can still have that. Yeah, okay. Only till four o'clock. Well, yeah, well obviously I, I'm aware of that. Um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about, we keep talking about vacancies. We know it's a national um, shortage of midwives. We know that we've got vacancies at Brimfield and we know that you know during last summer it was a really difficult time for the Brimfield site. We will always prioritise the acute setting, unfortunately, because we have to because of safety. Um, we still don't. We still got over 20 vacancies, so we would still probably be in the same situation if we were providing that interpartum care at St Peter's in terms of pulling the staff into the acute setting. Um, and um, have, what, oh, what else what was it? Um, Any that I haven't touched on. Sorry, I know there was a lot. You can always send some more questions in after because I know that was quite a lot then, what you had to say. I can't remember. Okay. Thank <laughs> you very much for your questions thank and you. thank you for your work at St. Peter's. Thank you so much. Sean. Sure. Uh, I'd first of all like to say thank you for the dedication and care that the doctors and clinicians of the NHS try and provide us all the time. Um, for the Mid-Essex Integrated Care Board, you say you cover 
a huge area, Rochford, Braintree, Grays, Halstead, Bavsden, Brentwood, Thurrock, and 1.2 million. Within that area, there's plans for 150,000 homes, which is at least another third of a million people. I can't believe that we don't have a capital budget to support those extra people. And maybe it's the wrong forum, maybe we need somebody from Essex here, um, and maybe we can go down to local provisions later. Um, <clears throat> but with that amount of population growth in the area, you must be talking about at least one more major hospital. <clears throat> Thank you. And Sir John, um, it's, it's very welcome to hear that you're supporting uh, local care um, and hospitals in the local area. I don't believe that's your voting history. Um, <laughs> You haven't actually voted for any foundation hospitals in the local area, um, and that may have actually helped us over the past 20 odd years or 25 years that you've been in post. Um, <clears throat> in, in terms of the local areas, I, I, we, we are growing tremendously, um, and a lot of the points that a lot of these people have made is that the transport links to cover us to go to Braintree to Rochford, all of these facilities are going to be overwhelmed. The, there's Braintree uh, Garden, community villages planned, thousands of houses in those areas. All of that support will be used for those local communities. We are asking for a community facility here which covers the whole of the Denji, which is also growing at the same rate, if not more. So can I ask you, why aren't you looking at capital increases to support new facilities. You're planning our future. We entrust our future to you. So why aren't you planning for that? Well, in terms of hospital provision, and we have across Mid and South Essex three major secondary hospitals, um, and there has been a lot of new facilities and expansion taking place in each of those, and as Dr. Sweeting was said, each has become specialist in particular uh, conditions. Um, in terms of the Denji and Mamulden district, we're never going to have a secondary hospital here. We're not going to have surgery taking place here, but we should have those facilities locally based, which people can access as they do currently at St Peter's. So, I mean, being realistic, what I'm determined to make sure is that what you can currently get at St Peter's, you should still be able to get within the town and that's something which I think uh, you've heard already the NHS commit to ensuring continues to happen but I mean I, I know perfectly well because I go to Burnham every week how long it takes to get from Malden to Burnham and I know that to get to Broomfield is even further but you know one has to be realistic we're not going to have a secondary hospital offering inpatient surgical care closer than Broomfield. <clears throat> why they haven't considered that additional extra population and the extra need for major facilities in the area? I'll, I'll probably take the question slightly wider as you've helpfully set out for us actually is that over the past 30 years we've seen a, a dramatic change in delivery in how the NHS has delivered services so in terms of people staying in hospital far less uh, length of stay, we call it, has reduced in hospital, far more services provided in the community. But the whole of the NHS, and in fact the whole of the health system, is grappling with the population change and how we manage uh, and care for our population for the 21st century. Now, of course, that in in involves capital or, or money for hospitals, but hospital and more beds are not the answer to this existential issue. Um, we know already with the new hospital uh, programme for the new hospitals that you've mentioned across the region, we will still need more provision than those beds will provide. And there will never be the workforce to do that, nor will there be the, the, the money for that. And so a lot of health leaders are looking uh, at expanding community care, but particularly the virtual care, virtual wards. We have 200 across our own system now and how we use technology to improve services going forward. And, and there is a massive transformation happening. Um, and we're all involved with that conversation at the moment. 
I, I know it, it is hard to hear, but there are radical changes happening, and the direction of the NHS is moving far more to providing care closer to home with specialist hubs for shorter times in hospital. We actually know for hospital for older people um, that if you're in, as you said, you, you can actually, if you don't walk around and use mobility, it's more confusing, you lose uh, rehabilitation potential. And so it's really important that we as doctors and healthcare professionals look at outcomes for our patients and the best settings for them. But it, it is something we're grappling with as a system. I, I think we all agree that um, provision for local healthcare is what we're looking for. Um, so well done, thank you. Um, in terms of the planning, we've allowed so many thousands of houses in an area. I, I don't see the corresponding people here. Maybe it is the Essex District Council that needs to come up here. And those people asked why they're not providing these facilities. Uh, thank you. Councillor Siddle, please. Yeah, so uh, we as an authority collect what they call Section 106 money. And for every house that's built, there's an, allocate, there's an amount of money in terms of Section 106 money. That money goes to Essex County Council, doesn't come to Malden District Council. And then Essex County Council says, OK, this money is spent across Essex. So we, give, we build houses in the Malden District, it goes to Essex Council. That money may not come back to the Malden District. And that's, that's the, the complication with the process. One of the things that we are looking at doing in terms of the future is what they call community infrastructure levy on any new developments. And if we implement a community infrastructure levy, that money comes directly to the district council and we can then say how that money is spent and where that money is spent. Unfortunately, Previous administrations at the council did not implement that. If they had implemented it, we'd have had a lot more money in the Malden district, and it's something that I want to see change. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tracy, please, as well. Thank, thank you. you. I, I, I think the other part of your question was, do we receive capital funding according to the population growth? And um, the Section 106 monies uh, that come from developers to councils for health are a really extremely small fraction of what those capital costs would be to provide those healthcare facilities. So, so, so the costs of providing that infrastructure falls to the NHS and our funds are severely limited. They don't grow at, in terms of capital monies at that same rate as the population and 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 should we um, have a developer invest the capital and then lease the building to us the revenue funding that we receive for that population is not sufficient to cover the cost of that building and those people's health care needs so we are having to uh, prioritize where we can spend the money that we do get according to the greatest amount of need. But, but there is a commonly held view that the Section 106 monies are sufficient to fund the provision of the healthcare facilities, and I just want to be really clear that they're not. Thank you. Gentleman here in the shirt, check shirt. Good evening. Uh, my name's Bob Lamb. I've lived here for nearly 40 years now. And um, I want to thank the National Health because in that time, I've had three operations, one at South End, one at Braintree, and one at Broomfield, and aftercare at St Peter's, and they're all angels and saints, those people. But one time I was taken to hospital, um, to Broomfield, I was in the ambulance. When I got there, I was the 21st ambulance in the line, and I had to wait in that ambulance until I had a trolley. They wheeled me in on a trolley. Um, I saw a doctor. I was having uh, blood tests and treatment in the waiting room because there wasn't a ward. Surely, Morden is quite central in Essex, so like from Chelmsford this side, Denji, uh, Whitham, and Wooden Ferries, surely they could build a hospital here to cover all that area. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Do you want to just quickly come back to Sweden? Thanks for your kind words about the care you received and 
in a sense, I, I sympathise. I've been a consultant on call and I've had to do ward rounds with ambulances outside and this is a reality and a challenge that we are facing. One of our big priorities this winter as an NHS was to make sure that patients in an ambulance uh, were delivered to the hospital as quickly as possible so they weren't waiting there so that those ambulances could get out to people that hadn't yet been assessed. Uh, and part of my role was to man a phone line to speak to ambulance crews uh, to do to support assessment and get them to appropriate care settings as well. So th that's really help helpful to hear. I think probably as my colleague has said, um, I, I think it's very un unrealistic that there would ever be a secondary care hospital, so a large hospital here providing uh, surgery and lots of intensive medicine. Rather, there are specialist hubs that link into community zones. And particularly with the advance of technology, uh, the virtual aspect, as I keep coming back to, uh, but also the ability to share records, to see reviews, and to offer consultations as well. Th that is fundamentally changing the way we do healthcare. I know there are challenges. I know there are access issues, which I hear about daily. Um, but there are some significant changes in health, which I'm, I'm excited about, as well as some of the challenges. OK. Thank you, Dr. Sweeting. Um, please step forward. Thank you. Good evening, panel, Sir John. I'm a retired nurse, and for 40 years, for 33 of those, I spent at St Peter's as a ward sister. I have seen many changes. I have sat in front of many consulting on what's going to happen to the hospital, the deterioration of it, and the provision of beds. My last ward, when I left there eight years ago, was the stroke ward. We now find that they have been sent to uh, Brentwood. Will you tell me if this is temporary or if this is permanent? Thank you. And thank you for your service to the town at, the, at St Peter's. Thank you. Please. I have also kept a folder of many incidences that have happened at St Peter's. And the opening comment in the Molden and Burnham Standard yesterday, the 9th of February, 2024, the opening paragraph was, concerned residents are given the chance to air their views to Molden's shake-up of St Peter's. I will then bring you to an article that was written on the 27th of November, 1992, Hospital shake-up. Molden Hospital services are, 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 are going to have a huge shake-up. New health centre facilities plus maternity and other facilities for the elderly are planned. The scheme could involve the sale of St Peter's, and we're talking 1992, the sale of St Peter's and rebuilding the hospital which sits on a six-acre site. Black Notley Hospital could be closed by March 1995. It's closed and it's now residential. St John's Hospital in Chelmsford will be closed by March 1998. That is also closed and is now residential. Consultation on the plans have just started. Why are we 32 years and still waiting? Dr. Sweeting. Uh, if I go, uh, um, uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for your service, uh, Morden, as well. I, I don't think we crossed over, uh, but I did used to come out uh, to St. Peter's to support some of our, our rehab units as well. Um, if we go back to the Brentwood question, which you raised, it, as you said, it was a temporary measure uh, as we set out in consultation for quality and safety concerns. Uh, you, you, you know the building better than I do. Uh, but in a modern healthcare facility, there were concerns with weight limits, uh, with damp and flooding, uh, and with even getting a bed in and the pivoting between wards as well. So all of these are significant, significant as well. So. Uh, and uh, as we've talked about, um, the, the opportunity for modern healthcare facilities to provide bigger spaces is, is key here. But I take your point that the, the, the delivery of high quality services is about staff. The building helps, but it's about staff. And I've heard lots of that today, and, and I'm proud to hear that as well. The second point in terms of the consultation, and I thank you for your memory, and I thank you for bringing that to us. Uh, 
it's, it's not a cop out. I, I, I wasn't there. I, I don't know, but I'm really grateful to, to listen to you and, and to see that history there. Um, we are listening. We are here. We want to engage. I, I, I can say sorry for the past, um, but we are here, and we really do want to listen to the people of Morden, which is what we're doing tonight. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for the articles. Very interesting. So, last speaker tonight. Thank you. Um, we're here on a consultation, apparently. Um, two things that you must take away are the excellence and the value of the historical and present care at St Peter's. You don't deny that. Unless I'm mistaken, everybody wants a hospital at St Peter's. Everybody. Now, we've, we've had a lot of generalities and expressions of intent and politics speak about a facility. I don't know what a facility is. Locally, I don't know what locally is. I know where Malden is, and I know where St Peter's is. And so I'd like to know if, if St Peter's is beyond repair, how much does it cost to rebuild St Peter's? So okay. it, it, it would cost significantly more than we have. Significantly uh, more than we have available. Just tell me how much it would cost. Let's come to what you have and what you might access later. But presumably you've ex explored those. And we'd we've had a lot of expressions of sentiment. I'd like some facts. Okay. How much does it cost to rebuild St Peter's? So, so the cost of building a hospital, a community hospital, would run into the hundreds of millions of pounds. Um, and, and we don't have that funding available. Where, where have you gone out to tender for that? We, we can't tender for that. We Why? don't have we don't because we don't have the funding available to pay for that. So you well, can't go out. Let's to tender. worry about the funding afterwards. Well, well, I'm it's a, possible I'm, there are lots of sources of funding, lots of sources of funding. If you said that, firstly, you look after 1.2 million people in mid and south west Essex. Let's say 200,000 of them are in the Malden area. Let's say you pass the hat round. It's not a popular um, thought, maybe, but it's just a little bit of inventive thinking. Give us £100 to rebuild all or part. Then we'll go out to some form of partnership. You mentioned Sainsbury's. Bupa would bite your hand off to contribute because they're already treating your patients around here. Let's get a team of professionals to just examine and stress test how much it would cost, who would contribute, how quickly it can be done, so that we can have St Peter's back. And let's, because it's a consultation, you said that, and because we haven't been very specific, you commit to coming back here in a couple of months, having rethought, because neither A or B would get the vote here. I'm pretty confident of that. Tell us how you change your view. And by the way, please bring someone from Essex with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Wendy. So, so what we're consulting on are the proposals that are set out here. We are not consulting on rebuilding St Peter's Hospital. We, 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 we do... Please. And, 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 and we do have facilities available in other community hospitals across Mid and South Essex to provide these services, and that capacity is there. OK. So, so, so we are, we are, so, so, so you're here. Excuse me, please, please let lady finish. Thank you. Then we can ask questions. Thank you. So, so we have done the planning analysis about what the intermediate care and what the stroke 
rehabilitation care needs are for the people of Mid and South Essex. And we've evaluated the different estates that we have got across Mid and South Essex and the resources we've got. And these proposals set out how we would utilize that capacity to meet the needs of people. And we do not have the funding available capital funding nor revenue funding and if and if funding is raised we as capital we still have to find the revenue funding to service that we do not have that funding available so the scope of our consultation is around the proposals that are presented to you here today and and that's what we want to hear people's views on and and from that feedback we will then go back and we will look at the different options, the different proposals, and then reach the decisions that we need to reach. What are you going to do with that money? So, so, so because no doubt there is a developer just itching to make those adjacent communities yeah. and the workers have to work there and they have to pay their rent 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 and they have to pay So, There's so, one standing over there, sir. So, so we, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, and thank you very much for your eloquent points and what we're doing. I'd like to end and thank you all for your patience, particularly the people who've been standing around here. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for your questions and sharing your experiences and feedback with the panel here. There are obviously other events to go to, but thank you for coming tonight. And thank you to the panel for, for coming and attending. And thank you for your questions. And good luck. And remember the consultation days. Thank you. Oh, sorry.